Well, it's saying recording. So Zoom hasn't lied to me yet. <laughs> why would it lie, man? Well, why would it lie now? A, is it sentient? And B, if it was, would it be a liar? You know? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, ooh, there, I'll tell you what, there's a little um, sneak preview of a film that's going to come up for me later on. Liar, liar. Um, no, <laughs> not liar, liar. <laughs> no, it could not be further from that film. Uh, I, I love liar, liar. Um, yes. But no, that is not what I had in mind. Right, we've talked. I'm glad that we've talked as much as we wanted to about each of these films. That's all that matters. Time is just time. It's just a construct, man. Yeah. So, uh, and so we've got now to, I know these are in sort of arbitrary order, but um, we've, we're we about to cover the, the, fir- the number five of our 10 honourable mentions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Brace yourself, everybody. Yeah, buckle up. Um, this is, well, basically, <laughs> this is, um, so I've done these in no particular order, but just I kind of feel like this would be very high up towards the 10 you know this is down that end of the honorable mentions sure and it, yes uh, lo and behold blow me down it's another <laughs> 1990s film and we we sort of covered a bit of this earlier uh, if i say the name nora efron lost does that mean anything to you uh i'm i'm sorry to say that no that that, that that's got no um no. nothing tied to it well don't worry don't worry because uh, i'll explain <laughs> it now so nora efron in the 90s did a trilogy of films which were about as rom-com as it gets really first one was called joe joe versus the volcano the second which is much more well known is called sleepless in seattle seattle yeah uh, and both of those two films star tom hanks and meg ryan meg ryan yeah uh, and the, th- the the third of the trilogy in the 90s stars would you believe it tom hanks and meg ryan what a shock yeah and it's the best of the three uh, I think a lot of people would probably say Sleepless and Seattle is like the classic, but no, for me, this you're, is... You're, you're about to say you've got mail, aren't you? I'm about to say you've got mail, yeah. Hey. yeah. Um, and this, oh man, I, well, I, I said I would try and minimise <laughs> my usage of the words criminally underrated, uh, but no, they have to come out for this. So basically, yeah, you mentioned my my love for Meg Ryan earlier. And um, Indeed. yeah, I, I think the reason that I love both, well, this is where it gets interesting. Basically, <laughs> in, in real life, I mean, after You've Got Mail came out, I think this was maybe like 2000 or something. She sort of famously I, I was in an interview on, I think it was Parkinson, I might be wrong, don't quote me on that, where uh, she didn't sort of paint herself in the best light. And, you know, people thought maybe she wasn't a very savory individual. And again, without wanting to be slanderous, um, unfortunately, there was a period where she thought that surgically altering her face would make her more attractive, which mm. um, is not something that, that chimes with me so much. It's a different idea to me of what constitutes beauty because she she was gorgeous as she was like in the 90s. And not, not only that, but, I mean, I'm attracted to like kookiness. For, like, so like we talked about Kate Winslet earlier in Eternal Sunshine. That's a classic example. Zoe Deschanel, I've got the ultimate crush on. And you think of the oh, film like, yeah. think of like Yes Man. Have you seen that? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> okay, well, anyone that has, her character in that fits this bill. And then Alison Hannigan as well. I mean, you know I've got a massive crush on her, Lars. Oh, she yeah. Was, so she was like Willow, you know, in Buffy, wasn't she? And she was like band camp girl. In, but for me, I kind of remember her as Lily from How I Met Your Mother. Mm. So anyway, that, that gives you a, a, a holistic idea of really something that I'm attracted <laughs> to. And so Meg Ryan is like the ultimate version of that, really, because it, in the 90s, particularly with Sleepless in Seattle in this film, she was just adorable. Um, and especially in this. So she's like, right, what I'll try and do with, with this film, right, I will try and give you a whistle-stop tour through maybe half of the synopsis. <laughs> because the thing is, Again, you know, we were talking about like, oh, I'm not so much a fan of this genre. And I'll be like, right, well, let me just explain to you what, what this film's like. And then maybe you'll be interested. This is me mm. doing this is me doing that. Right. So I'll just try and run through the premise as succinctly as I it. can. And, and I think by the end of this, as a listener, I'd think, all right, do you know what? I'm not into rom-coms, but that's that's got my interest. So Meg Ryan is like, she plays a, an owner of a quaint 
boutique kind of independent bookstore in uh, New York. Looks maybe kind of like the Soho sort of area. Although that's not important, is it? Uh, <laughs> so she <laughs> uh, this this story is passed down through the family, and it's kind of it's got everything celebratory about a true family business. In this case, kind of like an emphasis on igniting passion for literature, especially in children. Uh, it's like a place of love and, and virtue, really. Meanwhile, in an adjacent street, sort of on the same block, Fox Bookstores is preparing to open, which kind of represents the antithesis of this. It's like a corporate chain, professes to care about books, but that's it's like that's their chosen business model for sort of bringing, mm. in, the, bringing in the clams. It's just um, good PR. Yeah, and that's all they care about, really. But because of Fox's financial clout, they're about to occupy a much bigger unit and they can afford to sell cheaper. Um, we can all think of a relatable pub chain there. It's capitalist with a capital C, right? And, um, mm -hmm. and the, owner of nice. this the owner of this conglomerate is none other than Joe Fox, which, you guessed it, is played by Tom Hanks. So <gasps> naturally, this threatens to put the little shop around the corner out of business. And it actually, it's funny I said that because I think that's what they're called. I think the shop is called the shop around the corner or the little shop around the corner. Anyway, it's not long before the two meet. Joe Fox comes in to sort of suss her out as a competitor. Um, and it's not long before the antagonism starts and you see these people develop a, a really intense dislike for each other. Now, <laughs> little do they both know that they are actually anonymous pen pals online and have been for some time by this point. And further to this, they've had amazing chemistry on there, like almost to the point of romance, even though they're both married in their own lives. And they've always kind of been stringent about keeping it anonymous and not being specific about their, their personal or professional lives, but it kind of still feels illicit somehow because of how much it, it means to both of them. And the, the film is dated, I guess, by the fact that this is basically AOL, we're talking about with like a dial-up mm. modem. Yeah, we all, well, I say we all remember, you and I do. And so when they log in after their day, like those simple three words of, you've got mail, it's kind of offering them incredible excitement and refuge from their daily lives. And so, yeah, they're having to reconcile this, uh, these private chats with their respective marriages, but both of which aren't making their hearts flutter in the same way that this anonymous online conversation is. Mm. Uh, and and both of these you know partners by the way are none the wiser eventually one of them learns of the other's true identity and then it's a case of what happens from there and i'll leave it there because otherwise i could talk forever about that film <laughs> now that's funny because i didn't think that i'd seen you've got mail and yet hearing you describe that um, it has is, is, is jiggled something loose deep within the recesses of my mind. Well, it's got and Dave Chappelle I'm... in it. So, you know, you might, <laughs> if I say it's got Dave Chappelle that's, in it, that's you might. That's not necessarily a prerequisite for me watching a film. But no, yeah, but, sure. but I know you're a fan, you see. So I, I feel like oh, if, yeah, of um, course. if I said it's got Dave Chappelle in it, you go, yes, I remember him being me, in it. Especially a film me, like me this. Me and Dave. Yeah, because it's not We go back like train tracks. It's not the kind of thing you'd expect to see him pop up in, really. No, no, actually, I, I do remember him popping up, but I also remember Hanks going to visit her store and, and being sort of quite sort of dismissive and, so, you know, I'll, I'll come on, just sell up and let us have it. And, uh, obviously, her being uh, deeply offended by this sort of guy who just wanted to waltz in and destroy her entire life. Um, as you say, not not being aware of, of uh, who he actually is and... and not necessarily in a business reputation, but in terms of obviously her secret admirer. So yeah, well, clearly it's... I have at least watched part of this. So uh, that's that's interesting in itself. Because it's... Uh, be before you started talking, I already said never seen it. So yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, that's, that's the, the joy of this is, uh, you know, hopefully we're, we're unlocking memories for everyone. Well, yes. And, and yeah, this is the thing, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting just idea, you know, that these two people who in real life in physical proximity and contact loathe each other and then professionally mm. but then little do they know they're simultaneously having this other relationship anonymously and that's oh it's so fascinating but again it's got the um it's got that 90s drape over it which isn't for everyone but i mean if you love a rom-com i mean I've talked about some other rom-coms or at least like named them. So like mm. Sleepless in Seattle, which again is superb. Like it's a classic. It, 
understandably revered as a classic. I just prefer this. But then you've also got like One Fine Day, which I talked about. Well, I didn't talk about it. I just said the words One Fine Day at the very start of the first one. But that's that's a really good rom-com as well. What could possibly beat this, Lars? Well, stay tuned <laughs> and find out. Well, um, are, you, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm still there. No, no. Have, have, you, have you left me? No, I, um, I slapped my hand down on the table nonchalantly and then I sat back and uh, just awaited your response. <laughs> So I'll leave it there with you, Got Mail, because I I could talk about this film all day. I think, you know, if someone held me at gunpoint and said, you didn't uh, number your <laughs> your honourable mentions, what, you know, order them now, I'd probably go, mm. all right, um, You've Got Mail's probably number 11. You know, there you go. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's strong. W- would you say the 90s was uh, a, a, a golden period for rom-coms? Because I feel like it's the sort of thing now that's, has become fairly sort of formatted. They're trotted out uh, with sort of predictable outcomes, predictable sort of tropes. Lars, um, whereas... it's not just the uh, golden period for rom-coms. It's the only period for rom-coms, mate. Because, oh. yeah. Because, well, let, okay, case in point, Ghost comes out in 1990, right? And I, I, right. That's, that's more just a rum, I guess. No, I just, Ghost, Sleepless in Seattle, uh, um, One Fine Day, and You've Got Mail. I think they're all 90s. One Fine Day might not be. Um, if any pedant wants to call me out on that, please do. But um, no, man, the 90s was the, the decade for rom-coms, uh, without question. You'd have to go back maybe to like the 40s, you know, where, where things, the, the likes of... Gone with the wind. Casablanca. Casablanca. And stuff, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, forties and nineties. There you go. It's so, funny that you say era and I'd say error, but you know, tomato, tomato. Uh, right. Well, it's era. It's to, era. To, well, you were saying you you li- listen era uh, as I uh, as I speak. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna bring us full circle. I quietly with, uh, applauded another... that. Thank you. Thank you. Better, 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 better. better. Uh, we're talking about in my pick number five. Is the usual suspects right? Uh, now, basically, again, it, it's a film that I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm sure it's one of those films that that someone has spoiled out of spite for you. But it, it's it's a film that I'm definitely afraid of spoiling if you're not in the category of seen it and, and are interested. It's sort of a, a crime thriller. Would you would you say it's a, a, a sort of a, a film with a, a, a more than a, a degree of mystery to it? And I I, I love the way. The, the viewer and indeed the the police are sort of kept in the dark as as uh, events are brought to light and and maybe things aren't as they seem and, and and maybe they are and maybe things are being deliberately presented to be sort of misleading uh, and uh, well it, in, car- uh, in in any film where there's an element of who is you know who's the, the, the what's the reveal going to be in terms of who someone is mm. um yeah of course all that stuff's at play and yeah you could argue you know not better in many other things than in this it's it's so oh, exactly. good so good at that um, i mean K- kaiser soze himself has become absolutely a mythical feature uh, figure rather and, yes um yeah i i i think it's it's a, another one of those films which i i think a lot of people have heard about but not everyone has, has sat down to watch it yeah and it is 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 again an, an absolute joy a triumph uh i mean it's it's really got quite the cast uh, without boring with you with, with just reeling off a list of names uh, i almost want to say just just go and watch it but it's really yet again uh, i'm i'm a big fan of films that leave you feeling satisfied and my god when when all is revealed and uh, and the canvas is, is sort of laid bare and you can you can see the full masterpiece that's just unfailed uh before you it it's uh it's it's really one of those uh moments where you're just like oh oh wow okay right that's that's really great. Yeah, uh, I mean, before you know, I saw this, I I was in that camp. Maybe uh, there might be a few of us here that agree. I, for some reason, I always thought it was a Tarantino movie before I actually saw it, and then realised it wasn't. Mm. It's because it, I kind of the you know the vibe you would get maybe from watching a trailer would would intimate that it's it's a kind of again if you're listening, sorry, Quent. You know, that's not me disparaging yeah. your career or indeed any anyone else's career. But I, I always got that vibe from it. But when I watched it. No, it was it was very much its own. It, it's quite unique, really. Uh, like you say, yes. you know, I don't want to say too much on it for obvious reasons, but it's it's a superb film and another one I can't believe I didn't think of. Mm. It's one of those films where, where honestly, uh, dear listener, 
I, I could I could almost, you know, obviously I'm going to recommend every single film that I mentioned because, you know, my taste is impeccable. But if 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 you were going to slit my throat, uh, if I failed to nominate a film that you would enjoy, I'd probably put my life on Usual Suspects. Now, that's quite a strong statement. I stand by every word of it. Well, no, that, that is a strong statement, but I, I can respect that. It's, 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 it's an intelligent thriller. Uh, an, an amazing game of cat and mouse, very well acted, stylish, humorous in places. What's not to love? Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, there's nothing more I can really add on it. Uh, you, you kind of you said a few of the things that I would have said, I think, about that film, and it's mm. one that I've only ever seen once as well. So, again, all the more reason to add that to the list. But in a way, that's that's one of the few things that sort of kept it out of the top ten. Is once you're aware of the, the the revelation, shall we say, is it not, you know, it, 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 I have watched it again, you know, having known exactly what happens and I still enjoyed it very much. So I can't say that it, it ruins it to know what, what comes to happen because, you know, it's, it's another one of those uh, situations where you're looking for details, looking for, oh, oh, okay. So, uh, he was really him or, you know, he was helping or he wasn't. And, you know, all, all the different uh, different points where, you know, there's there's a bit of a grey area. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's a really impressive film. It's just just sneaked out of the top 10, that one. And it kind of allows the viewer to bring something to the viewing experience as well, because it does expect that of you to, to try and be looking ahead to piece things together. And um, yes. And so there, it, it's almost interactive in that sense. Um, mm. which is great not many films do that and this does so watch it if you haven't we've got to, well, well we've got halfway through the honorable mentions now and i mean calling them honorable mentions is doing a real disservice and i've kept doing that so i apologize i might try and stop that here <laughs> on because these are films we love they just haven't quite made the top 10 and look how long we've been like ogling over them so oh sure long may it continue so indeed <laughs> um let's just i'll just jump straight in then shall i yeah you you shine on you crazy diamond thank you well uh outside of the 90s this time <laughs> are you are you feeling okay it's a bold departure isn't it um <laughs> treacherous territory oh. now, uh when discussing filmmakers uh we've kind of covered a couple by the likes of tarantino or kubrick um, I'm not sure if we've talked about anything Spielberg yet, but you can be damn sure we will. But here, I want to talk about David Lynch. Now, Ooh. he has a catalogue of, which is not for everyone, let's face it. Um, <laughs> That's another statement. Like <clears throat> Eraserhead, for example, um, mm. which that might have been the film you were expecting me to mention here. Blue Velvet, Mulholland uh, Dwive. Mulholland Drive, Twin Peaks. All right, Jonathan Ross. You can see what I did there. I thought I had to twin, and then I brought the W into the word drive. Uh, You're smarter than your lips have allowed you to be. So, so Mulholland Drive and Twin Peaks, and then you've got, um, <laughs> and then you've also got a lesser-known show on Netflix that he did recently, where he was uh, David Lynch played a chain-smoking detective who was interrogating a monkey on a train about a crime. Uh, but that's not what I'm discussing here. No, no, no. Uh, none, of, none of the aforementioned. No, I want to talk about probably, arguably, the least weird film in his catalogue, which is The Elephant Man. Ah. And this um, is your Carl Pilkington side coming out. Uh, well, yeah, it's one of his favourite films, along with Kez, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so 1980, this came out. And also, you know, we talk about lynch's other films being weird you know Lars better than anyone it's not that i don't appreciate weird i'm a, mm. a roaring We'd never ambassador. Have got on if you didn't no exactly <laughs> but this is the film of his that kind of stays with me the most and the one wow. would probably consider the most rewatchable as well mm. and it's based it's, it's based on a true story of joseph merrick who's commonly known as john merrick and i might be getting this wrong because i um, I can't really remember the start of this film very well, but I, I think, right, that's a good start, isn't it? When um, talking about <laughs> one of your favourite films, I think this happened. Um, his mother 
uh, was trampled by an elephant whilst pregnant with him. And, and I think that's what happened. And that presumably played a big part in his severe deformities. And if, if you don't know, that's what this is about. If you didn't yeah. know, you do now. So, yeah, Joseph Merrick uh, is a man with, with severe uh, deformities. And the interesting thing is that, like, David Lynch sort of makes a clear point of not showing you what he looks like for quite some time, which is a common trope in films with, like, I don't want to use the word, word monster because that's not what Joseph Merrick is, but you know what I mean when I use that analogy, that, like, yes. di- directors will hold back on, on, on showing something like that that's jarring. Like to, he, to he has a horrific appearance, even if he, by his own actions, does not necessarily inspire horror. Yeah, uh, exactly. And and the interesting thing is that in this film, it's sort of revealed with a bang, like when it does, just as it is with someone in the film at the time. And it's sort of cleverly designed to give you the same shock that, that, that they got. And so, yeah, for Paul, uh, I mean, everyone thinks John Merrick, but I'm going to continue to use the correct name. For, so for Paul Joseph Merrick, like I can only imagine what the and remember, of course, this is based on a true story. I can only imagine sure. what this must be like for one's mental well-being, you know, like especially when growing up. And during the period where he was growing up, he tragically found himself sort of being paraded as the elephant man in like a shady backstreet circus. And this is where Dr. Frederick Treves comes in, who's played by Anthony Hopkins brilliantly, uh, who discovers him in this sideshow, right? And... Um, you talk about acting right now it's difficult to pin down what the barometer is or the hallmark of like a really good actor that's set apart Mm. but a lot of people commonly look at sort of crying you know being able to like turn on the waterworks sure and and like I don't know if that's like a a measurement or not but we talked about ghosts earlier or I talked about ghosts and Demi Moore famously does that time and time again in that film really well but like in this the moment where Dr Treves sees Joseph Merrick for the first time there's this prolonged shot on his face where a, a, a tear is drawn and it's just it's it's a stunning piece of acting that I vividly remember from this film mm. and from there uh, he sort of whisks him out of this living nightmare and into like proper medical care of a hospital and he's he is studied for like the purposes of science but equally like treated with compassion for the first time in his life and given the chance of actually like living some sort of life and this is where you really get to know who Joseph Merrick is and you realize that he's always had aspirations of just learning and kind of experiencing culture and and the, the arts and he's kind of taught some of this etiquette along the way and again you know I don't want to just talk through the plot at all but like towards the end there's a scene which I'll be a bit cryptic about, I guess. There's a scene at the theatre, right, where I'm just thinking about what to say, really. He he goes to the theatre, and in fact, that's all I'll say. He goes to the theatre, but there's this shot that's involved in that kind of little passage or scene or act or whatever you want to call it, which, I mean, you know a little bold comment, but, like, it, the, mm. it's quite possibly the most moving scene in a film that, that I can think of right now. Wow. It's, it's I, you know, I could see that film once and like never forget that scene. And the, the ending is equally tear jerking, um, which, you know, without describing what happens, I know it famously uses Adagio for strings, which is like a, a piece of music that you'd have heard, Loz, even if you don't know it by name. Um, mm-hmm who I think maybe Samuel Barber was the, was the original composer. I don't know. Again, that's probably not important here. But it's, it's yeah, so in summary, it's just very touching all the way through. It is a film you probably only ever need to see once. Um, mm. it, it really makes you think. And it, it might not be a film to go to for comfort, like you would with, like, <laughs> Ragn- was it Ragnarok? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right so, yeah, so, you know, there are films coming up that I could name in a similar, you know, vein, but, like, yeah, this is not one of those. Um, no. It's, it's not a film you watch, um, you know, with your nan before Christmas dinner, but it's... <laughs> that's not any mark down on how good it is. It's superb, and it's very different to other Lynch films, you know, if anyone's seen a Razorhead, 
Um, and frankly, if you have seen a Razorhead, I would understand if that was the only Lynch film you've ever watched and you've gone, no, n- never again, no more. Uh, I love it. I love a Razorhead. And my word, I could talk about that film at length um, mm. for its vibe and its special effects. But we're not, no, we're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about The Elephant Man. <laughs> and um, it's, it's superb. Have you, have you seen it, Lars? I, honestly, I can't say that I have. I, I've seen certain snippets from the film uh, enough to ascertain, I do believe, it is in black and white. Am I correct? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Uh, and obviously there's there's a, a, a connection with uh, Carl Pilkington. <laughs> so, well, only, um, in, the, only I, in the sense that he, he named it as a favourite film. Yes, and also that he went to visit the Elephant Baba and stuff like that, which is also, you could say, um, sort of ties in at least. Um, yeah, yes, no, it, but, uh, well, I suppose, yeah, the Elephant Baba has volunteered himself for public viewing and scrutiny. Hmm. So in that sense, there's a fundamental difference. Um, Joseph Merrick just wanted to live his life. And that's where you get this, this the famous line in the film, which is that I'm not, well, in fact, I can't even remember where, where, what it is. I think it's just simply, I am not an animal. You know, I am a human mm. being. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, sorry, I don't want to trample on your your response, but no, I did no, just want to make that's that okay. Yeah, I, I um, I, it's a film I I found intriguing. It's it's yet another choice of yours that I I'd be quite happy to um to follow it up. It's just no, never one that really seems to uh, jump out at me as you know. Oh, let's sit down and watch the Elephant Man tonight. But yeah, uh, I I guess at, at almost all of the the films, in in, in fact, probably all. I, I I'm such a, a character person that um. You know, if, if I can associate with a character, uh, if I can sort of put myself in their shoes, even if it is a, a fantastical journey or, or certainly something so far away from my own individual experience, uh, if I can associate with that character, regardless of, of you know, where they are or what they're going through, uh, then um, really the film's got me. And I think that, uh, you know, that would really be compelling to see uh, quite from the sounds of it quite an honest depiction of what it'd be like to to live a life with with such uh, horrific injuries frankly yeah um it's it's yeah i mean it, it really does and because of the the deformities with his face um he really struggles with speech and diction you know and mm. that kind of on its own um you you sort of empathize on it maybe initially out of pity but then you you grow to know him as a person and i suppose i should say that I, i'm well i'm 90 percent sure i should know this so maybe i should quickly just google this because if i've got this wrong that would be embarrassing i think it's john hurt hmm. that plays joseph merrick um yes that seems to ring a bell yeah i mean i i'm 99 sure it is yeah it's john hurt yeah and yeah, yeah. he's incredible in this um quite incredible well, what a role, really! You know, speaking as a as a a very 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 amateur actor myself, what what a role to try and and take on, um, but with so much range in it, you know. Well, exactly, and especially when you're you're literally masked so heavily, um, a by mm. the by the um, the prosthetics, and then by a literal mask for some of it, and then also yeah. in terms of diction, you know, your voice is disguised. You wouldn't know it's John Hurt. Um, unless you could pick out the nuances in his acting, which I, I, I defy anyone to really kind of be able to do that with someone where they can't yeah. recognise the look and sound of someone, you know. But yeah, he's, oh, he's superb in it. And as is um, Anthony Hopkins. So oh, yes, yeah, old, old Hoppo. It's, yeah, it's not light viewing. And again, it's another film that you may only ever need to see once. You know, it just just really makes you, makes you think and... Um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's bounce it back over the net to your good self. All right. Well, uh, you know, from, going from a film that you know um, really makes you think to to perhaps a film that that might not require quite the most sort of cerebral attention. Um, I've been much maligned uh, amongst my friends for this take, and okay. it, it, it's it's something personal to me. As is as is everything else uh, on this on this list. And again, I'm talking about a character uh, in this film in particular. Uh, I I, uh, I associated with the character. I felt his struggles. It, it seemed a, a, a fairly organic path through, through throughout his his sort of uh, trials and tribulations through the film. And uh, it's a sort of arrive at the end 
uh, in, in a fairly predictable style, sure, but that doesn't mean to say that if you're not involved, uh, if you're not engaged by the character, it may come off as a little flat. Whereas obviously me, myself, uh, I was engaged and um, it's a film of intense beauty of, of again, many, many great set pieces and uh, reduced me to tears on at least two points. And uh, afterwards, I, I genuinely uh, not so much mourned the loss of the, the, the setting, but mourned one of the characters because I genuinely felt uh, a, a love for, for that character and for, for her to have not been there anymore it was genuinely a, 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 a small a small morning for me I'm really intrigued uh, we're, to hear what you're going to say <laughs> so we're talking about Avatar right yeah um, I wasn't one of these who was uh, you know I heard especially in America they were talking about how uh, they'd set up support groups for people who'd been to see Avatar particularly in the 3D and that they'd essentially needed to talk to somebody because they were so depressed that they would never get to experience anything as lush and as wondrous as Pandora themselves. But having felt so sort of engrossed into the film that they felt like they had been there and that nothing would ever sort of top it since. And I, I maybe uh, I, I've had it pointed out to me, maybe it's the case I'm not familiar with things like Dance with Wolves, which uh, I've understood to be a fairly similar plot. Um, I'm not at all saying that Avatar isn't a plot that you can see developing before your eyes. And I, I do love that the word unobtainium, uh, which, which <laughs> yeah. is, is definitely something to be taken the mickey out of. But yeah, uh, as, as a guy, uh, I mean, again, uh, you know, I want, I want you all to go out there and, and watch every one of these damn films because I will be uh, if I haven't. And uh, the, the story of a, a man who was a soldier, a career soldier, he's lost his brother and is offered the chance to sort of step foot into his shoes in serving his country. He's lost the, the, the loss of his legs. And that's something that was really an entry point for me into the character and to be given almost like a second lease on life, to be given a chance to integrate into a, a culture so different to our own and sort of learn to rely on his instincts and, and become sort of a part of the tribe and a part of the jungle that they inhabit in many respects. And even though I think he's still skeptical uh, right up until the end about the, their religion, perhaps, or their beliefs and, and, and traditions and all the rest of it, a really nice natural romance between the, the, the two main characters. Oh, definitely, yeah. you know, Supported by a, a really <laughs> decent, a supporting cast i mean sigourney weaver uh, is is uh, you know probably just a bit more than a cameo but is is a really great supporting character um there's there's several of them which i'm not going to name for you now because i want you to watch it mm. but yeah um no i'll take your point I, I, I don't think i don't think sigourney weaver's brought in on kitsch values like she brings something to that role which oh yeah i yeah. think really suited her you know as a person mm even more so than like an actress or actor. And yeah, she's brilliant in that. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll let you carry on. There's a couple of things I can say about this film, but I'm quite happy to sit back and listen to you and your adoration of this film, because I knew this was going to come up somewhere. And I'm oh, actually, yes, I'm yes. amazed this hasn't made the top 10. I just realised mm. this hasn't made your top 10. No, uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that point, actually, because as, as you well know, I'm, I'm, I am very fond of this film. And uh, I mean... Again, without giving away plot points, there there was a point where something happened, obviously, and I was absolutely <laughs> devastated for the, for the characters to the point where tears were rolling down my face. I think I know and, what you mean, but I, yeah, uh, I'm not going to say. And, and you know, I've I've spoken to uh, to, to other uh, uh, sort of peers of mine uh, who who've looked at me like I'm stark raving mad. But I'm sorry, I, I, I can, you know, I show emotional vulnerability. I have had, I did. And, um, you know, that, that definitely, you know, uh, uh, sort of putting myself in Jake's shoes uh, uh, it really, I think, was, uh, was helpful. But also, I have to say, there is a reason it's in honourable mentions and not in the top 10. And that is probably as much as I, I can see it's a fairly organic journey 
that they take Jake on uh, and all the rest of it. It, it. On further watches, I will say that predictability has sort of counted against it. I, st I still love it. I still think it's a great story and uh, something that I get a, a great deal of enjoyment from. Uh, but it's just not top 10. I mean, <clears throat> this is, I'm pretty sure, I mean, obviously it's important to say inflation um, being factored in, uh, like the highest grossing film ever, I think. Or hasn't it just been usurped by an Avengers film or something? But um, I believe it's second and it's been after after inflation adjustment, Gone with the Wind is now uh the the total the the highest grossing right okay yeah because i was going to say without inflation you know it, um being factored in i know that titanic is still there or thereabouts there's one film which i'm coming to later so i'm not going to talk about it now um but yeah so on the one side this is the point i was getting at that it's obviously been incredibly popular if you're solely talking about the number of people that flocked to see it to begin with or have bought it on dvd or whatever but then at the same time uh, and this ties in with what you were saying about, you know, the discussions we've had with mates who've seen it, who maybe haven't looked at it with as quite the degree of love and reverence that you do. It's almost mm. as if, right, because obviously James Cameron, and it's very much got that blockbuster style, which obviously oh, Titanic, definitely. Titanic as well. Um, and I think sometimes there's almost this like herd mentality of not wanting to be in the herd. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, yes. Fro so Frozen comes out and just, you know, it's like no nothing else has been talked about on end for six months. And um, and I enjoyed being in the minority of people that hadn't seen Frozen. Same applies to Game of Thrones, but eventually I buckled and I'm glad I did. But <laughs> that's not the, case, the, the point that's being made here. So yeah, there's, um, there's that kind of, this is such a, a stratospheric thing that I almost don't want to be a part of it. And that's down to like a problem within someone, you know, rather than like really them giving merit or not giving merit to the film. And mm. I I can't remember when I first saw Avatar. Well, no, actually it was, I did go to the cinema to see it. Um, I didn't see it in 3D for some reason. I remember seeing Prometheus in 3D, but again, I'm going to- Yeah, I, I, I regret not having seen it in 3D, but there we go. But um, it's obviously a visually blockbusting film on its own. But what I love about it, yes, it's sort of James Cameron and it's got that, um, I'm not going to go at James Cameron when I say that, what I mean is that it's just, it is blockbusting, you know, it was always going to be the budget that was given to it, it was mm. very much meant to be that way and I'm kind of glad it and, was. And the time they took on it as well. Yeah, but what I like, what I really liked about it is that it touches on some really deep things, like mm. the, the relationships between forgive me for not knowing the names of the characters, but the the, the, the main relationship between the protagonist and the, the, the Navi girl, let's just say girl, I know that's not... The yes, part. yeah, uh, Zoe Saldana's character. So that, 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 that touches on this sort of love on like a pure and primal level. And that, that is the mantra and philosophy of the Navi. And they're, they're living um, a way of life that we are so far behind in terms mm. of just what is good, what is for the betterment of us as a species. And they, they have that. And so, yeah, there's this huge morality element to this film, which if it didn't have that in it, I would have hated it, quite frankly. I would have just, mm -hmm. but, but that is what absolutely makes it. And, you know, again, without wanting to divulge, I, I assume when you were talking about that one scene that broke your heart, it has quite a lot to do with that. And, and I felt the same when I saw that same scene. I, I assume that's what mm. you mean there. Yes. And a, 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 an area of great significance uh, for, for the tribe. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's also, I mean, you talked about him having like a second lease on life with his mobility. Mm. And that makes me think of, I mean, I'll jump ahead for a minute and I'll do this very quickly because it's this is TV I'm walking into now. But hmm. one, of, one of my favourite shows, and I won't name it, but I'll name the episode, which is inadvertently naming it. There's an episode called San Junipero, which is very much about that, uh, being given this second chance at life, this new lease on life, but being, being given something incredibly liberating to how you can live your life compared to how you could before. And that is really moving and touching on its own, not just in that bit, but in this. And that, that's an integral part of Avatar 
Um, I mean, yeah, we're, the world's awaiting the sequels, aren't they? I believe all three sequels are being filmed at once. And then there's, there's going to be like three sequels dropped in, you know, annually or something. Well, again, according to uh, Wikipedia that I've got open in front of me, uh, Avatar 2 and Avatar 3 have completed principal filming. So uh, we're looking at a December 16th, 2022 and December 20th, 2024, respectively, for either. Well, I'm all for them. <laughs> mm. And well, I've got one thing over you, Luz, which is that I've been to Pandora, mate. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have, haven't you? Yeah, you I, little tart. <laughs> I, I went in 2017, I went to Disney's Animal Kingdom in Florida and experienced Pandora, the world of Avatar, and they'd replicated the, the hanging rocks and uh, they had a ride called Flight of Passage, which was just unbelievable. Uh, and I brought I brought back a staff for you, didn't I? Yes, um, I was going to say I certainly benefited from that trip. <laughs> you did, um, and yeah, uh, we well, yeah, we went out for for Loz's birthday in, in Cheltenham, wasn't it? Um, it was. I Mr Mulligan's, and I just yes, that's right, Mr Mulligan's crazy golf, and and I brought along your birthday staff, which was illuminated, and <laughs> I couldn't wait to hand that over to you, Luz. I couldn't wait. Yeah. And we did it over a meal as well. We were sat down for a meal, and then I decided this will be the opportune moment to just, like, crack this thing out that's just so <laughs> overbearing. that like, people people downstairs are going to be like, what's that thing up there? You know, it was uh, it was a great moment. I, I, I credit that staff with my victory on the crazy golf course. I would. I mean, yeah, yeah I would. But I'm saying that because I lost. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, should we? Right. What, what are we on next then? Yeah, Avatar, man. I'm. Uh, I'll say again. I'm flummoxed. That that's not made you top ten because I was expecting that to be top three. You know. Yeah, well. Right. Well, there's life. Life in the old dog yet. Yeah. There is, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> right. Where where were we? The elephant man. Okay. So that was. Yeah. So that has a very distinct vibe. Let's go in the opposite direction, shall we? Let's talk about a rip-roaring farce, a romp in the true sense of the word, right? Oh. And surprise, surprise, this is another 90s film, Lars. But uh, this this is a film that could have probably existed in any decade, to be honest. It doesn't have that 90s lens over it. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Oh, what a pull. So <laughs> this film is just... Chaos. Um, mm. Where do I begin? So Huntress Thompson was the the, the writer who he, I mean he's an enigma. There's no other way of saying it really. He did stuff like the Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail and the Rum Diaries, but Fear and Loathing mm. I think is the most famous thing he's sort of done. And then um, well, how do I try and describe this one succinctly? Journalist Raoul Duke, mm. who's played by Johnny Depp, and his. Um, uh, again, accentuated brackets motion. Attorney, yeah. Dr. Dr. Gonzo, who's played by Benicio del Toro, majestic old, old Benich. Um, and they, well, they they go to Vegas, don't they, for an assignment to cover a, like a motorbike race across the Mojave mm. Desert. And of course, they end up doing virtually anything but, and just descend into like a drug fueled weekend of debauchery, which, quite frankly, needs to be seen to be believed. Oh, undoubtedly. And, I mean, if either of my parents are listening, they might be shuddering when they heard this name come up. But I mean, th this film it has nothing. It's not to blame for me have, ever having an interest in the drug culture. You know, that was just me being inquisitive and having an interest in, in that facet of life anyway. I mean, in, if anything, this film, the, the drugs are peripheral in this to me. I, I was much more grabbed by the notion of these two nutters having mm. somehow managed to achieve this echelon in their lives. And then they embark on this trip in every sense of the word that you get the sense that would have somehow happened anyway, you know, without drugs. Yes. Being like, it's just a caper, isn't it? It's just fun. It's two nutters causing bedlam. And um, it's got, uh, it's got, I mean, in terms of other cast, well, Cameron Diaz plays a cameo in a lift, which is mm -hmm. hilarious. Um, Christina Ricci's in this. Christina Ricci, yeah. Uh, who I always think of from Casper. But again, that's See, it's, I, it's always Adam's family for me. Yeah, I guess, you know, we both grew up in that that era, didn't we? Oh, sorry, era. Is that what you said? Um, screw you, bitch. Um, <laughs> so I think of Casper. 
I was I was just going to say whenever I'm whenever I'm reaching for Ricci, it's Adam's family for me. Hey, yeah, I always think of Casper. See, but I've I, never seen it. Never seen it. Never felt compelled to either. Well, it's a different film to what we're talking about here. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, it's, just a it's, bit. It's decent. It's decent. Uh, but no. So with everything I've just said, right? Yes, this film is about absolute bedlam all around. But um, it does have time for some very profound observations on like the human psyche, um, mm. mainly from uh, Raoul Duke, who is a writer, and he's kind of a paraphrasing kind of version of Hunter S. Thompson, really, in the film. And he does stop. I mean, here they are, right, in like the hoi polloi of Las Vegas and in their own introspective madnesses. But yet there are these like moments where you know, he stops and sort of ruminates on the navigation of the like the wider world in general. And it's it's quite profound. It really is. It's a force of nature, this film. Um, it, it is beautiful and, and terrifying at the same time. I, I, I've never I have experimented with some things, but I never tried acid. And I always thought that this uh, would be the, the truest sort of realization as to, to what acid would be like without having to take acid. I, I have actually, uh, you know, prescribed it to some of my friends in that respect, that if they were ever curious about, you know, uh, what what psychedelics may, may well do, um, to, to have a look at <laughs> Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, uh, and not to say necessarily that every instance of, of the various drugs that are consumed throughout the film is, is, is a, as a direct sort of correlation between acid or, or again, uh, any other drug because I think th these things are also subjective but uh, oh my god I mean um, I, I started watching it for the first time and I was stone cold sober and by the time the film finished I, I did not feel sober and I had not <laughs> yeah. I did not I did not consume anything to make me in any in, in any way t intoxicated I but, think um, that's yeah I, I think that's got a lot to do with the, the madnesses of the, those two characters uh, because mm. I think honestly um, I would say that this film only offers so much in terms of being an accurate depiction of what like psychedelics are really like. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's I mean it's well, interesting. They've, they've still they... got to present a narrative, haven't they? So yeah, 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 and it's it's just I mean there's one drug in particular, right? And you know how we talked about um, uh, South Park, wasn't it? When we talked about Scarface. Oh yes. Right. Well, there, there's. I mean, this. I'll have to. I'll, this is a very sensitive subject to be treading on, um, because you know. Uh, well, yeah. How do I even say this? Right. Well, anyone who's interested in anything conspiracy related, um, this film features something called adrenochrome, which mm. Raoul Duke pops at one point, and there are some very interesting theories, conspiracies around that in Hollywood and South Park did this recently and they did it in such detail and I can't believe they got away with it. So if they got away with it, then clearly I can get away with what I'm saying here because this is child's play. This is just like, just mentioning it really. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, so adrenochrome features and um, that that's really interesting. Um, and it, if you don't know what adrenochrome is, watch the film and find out because I don't want to be the one that explains it to you. <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's, it's in polar opposite to The Elephant Man, which was the last film I talked about. This is just so much fun. Um, it's if you're, you know, just against drugs, that of course, that's absolutely understandable and fine. But it shouldn't deter you from watching a film like this, even though drugs no. feature in it. Because this is just a really well written, directed, acted film that is just in its own world, really. And it needs to be seen, I think. And yeah, uh, this was one of the first to go into my honourable mentions because I've seen it a good few times now. I love it. Um, I love a different thing about it each time. But it does have something I take away um, existentially each time as well. Like I say, there are these moments of, mm. of pathos, um, which are necessary, really, to break up the, the, the madness that's unfolding at times. It's, well, I think it's that's illness, a, a, yeah. good, a good metaphor for the writings of, of Hunter S. Thompson as well. I think, you know, he, he's got a, a, a savage honestness to him, uh, as well as this sort of, you know, drug fueled background. But I think you, you could choose to focus on that and sort of write off his opinions as sort of the mad, mad ramblings of a, a, a you know, a, a, a mind addled by various drugs. But at the same time, I think it's a it's a mad world. And, and sometimes to be mad is 
is the the sanest response. Yeah, um, you, you have to you have to allow you know you you have to kind of give up a certain amount of yourself to engage with what he's saying because if you have this overlay like filter of well no he's done drugs so how can I credit how can I give credence to anything he's saying well then mm. you fall into a bracket of people that are, are probably not going to have lived like a fulfilling life you know I don't want to get into you know anything that's insulting to anyone that's like just morally completely opposed to drugs because that's fine but if um if you were to just dismiss firsthand that the the musings and opinion of someone who's had experiences with drugs then um, it's it's a hard one really i've probably not said that at all in the in the way that i really wanted to but this is kind of yeah there's a lot of things that raul duke and ergo you know hunter s thompson write about it particularly in this film that are, are fascinating and they're intelligent and they're considered and they, they they demonstrate a holistic view of the world that's come from living a bit, you know, and learning about things that you won't necessarily mm. learn about um, in mainstream education or just a nine to five office job. You know, there, there are life lessons in this film that are so valuable and it doesn't necessarily require huffing stuff and wandering around a casino. Yeah, but, quite. Um, but I mean, you know what I'm getting at without wanting to waffle. Oh, definitely. I mean, in, in a way, uh, I, I think I think some people. I mean, I, as I say, I, I don't profess to be a, a student of uh, Hunter Thompson, but I, I always got the feeling that for for all his savagery and and for all of these um, sort of trippy, uh, you know, a, a escapades that he goes on. Uh, actually, his his outlook, even though he could be sort of a, aggressive and, a, and abrasive in himself, that he actually always wanted the best. And his his sort of uh, you know various sort of rages at, um, at various subjects. I mean, I, I know for a fact that he was uh, particularly critical of, of of President Nixon in the in America. I mean, Still living on the campaign trail is interesting with regards to that mm. type of thing. Yeah. But I think he he always sort of came originally from a place of hope that we could all sort of live together and find a way to accept all uh, each other, you know, with with love and sort of dignity and and embrace our differences rather than than run scared uh, from them and and you know uh, for for us all to sort of pursue a, a perhaps a, a greater a greater. To endeavour to be greater than just perhaps you know pumping gas or flipping burgers for a living or you know not necessarily those specifically. Uh, I mean, I myself am a supermarket worker, uh, so you know it's not as if I particularly look down on on the service trade uh, at all. But you're a um, super you're a super worker, mate. <laughs> and um, and oh, also that. this now this is like this, this kind of touches on the American dream those words come up quite a lot in this film mm. and it, but it's about more than that it's it's about the I mean it is about the American dream really but it goes back uh, uh, predates what most people now commonly think of the American dream it predates that and it goes back to you know what was really hoped for with with not just that but humanity um which is what you were talking about you know it's very much about that but here are these guys you could argue wasting their lives away in some degree, but simultaneously they're living on, on a level that's just incredible. And um, yeah, it's very much about just living, you know, and a lot of these films are going to be about that. A lot of the ones we've discussed are going to be about that. And a lot of the ones that are to be discussed will be about that. And we're back, Roz. Woohoo! Uh, Woo! Yeah, baby! So right, it's, it's now, over to you. Now, now, certainly from uh, from fear and loathing in Las Vegas, there's a bit of a left turn. Um, but those of you who, who actually know me, the, the lucky few, uh, you, you will not be surprised by this choice in the slightest. And it is actually a, a film that I, I think really uh, perhaps is misunderstood uh, because the, the central acting performance is, is, is really, I think, very, very commendable. And I, I think it's, again, it's a strong narrative. And, uh, you know, the, the story's culmination, uh, once more, is a really satisfying payoff. Um, you, you might well say it's, it's the hero's journey. It's just not necessarily 
uh, the the traditional format and or foes that the hero is uh, is fighting against. Well, the the film I'm talking about is Eight Mile. Well, that that got mentioned earlier briefly. Mm, yeah, I wasn't expecting now, that to come up again. But I, I, yeah, sorry, please talk away. Well, I mean, obviously, it's it's sort of semi autobiographical, and being a big fan of Eminem, it definitely helps. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but. Um, you know, as I say, as, as, a, as a character piece, I think we can all sort of sympathise with where uh, Jimmy, uh, be rabbit, if you will, uh, is in his life. You know, he's, he's uh, deeply troubled uh, in many ways. He's happier at work than he is at home uh, because, you know, things aren't, aren't stable. They're struggling for money. Um, they're actually uh, evicted from their trailer at one point in the film. Um, and, you know, it, it, uh, he's got his young sister who he, he might as well be a, a father to as well. Uh, he's, he's, he's working at um, a metal castings factory, I think it is. And, you know, it, it's dull, repetitive work that, you know, requires no sort of skill from himself or, or, uh, or practically anybody else. Um, and, you know, he, he finds this outlet, the, the, the one thing that he's got that other people sort of not only can't take away from him, but the one, you know, area in his life that he can shine in is, is battle rap. And I, I know that, you know, perhaps a lot of folks might not be completely au fait with battle rap, uh, but, you know, that that sort of mental jousting, uh, you know, the, the desire to um, sort of prove yourself above your competitors and, you know, to do so in an entertaining way that also sort of works within the rhythm of the the backing songs or, or sometimes even not the backing songs it is brilliant I, I think the the underlying story in itself is very human um, I think we've we've all been there you know that we felt sort of uh, unfulfilled in life and, and feeling like there's a, a better life for us around the corner if only we could sort of get to that next level and uh, I mean I, I think the, the the soundtrack I mean obviously done by Eminem funnily enough but it, it is, is another, you know, I mean, everyone's, uh, you know, knows about Lose Yourself, uh, what an anthem that is. It, it, you know, I, I, again, I, I don't want to be too simplistic. And at the same time, I don't want to give too much away. It's, it's, it's just great. It's uh, a great story, well acted, well presented. Um, I believed in every minute, uh, totally invested in the character and um, was, was utterly uh, thrilled from start to finish. This is a film I've seen once again. Um, mm. And I was, you know, listening like intently to what you were saying there about that whole kind of like getting to the next level. What mm. I kind of remembered about this, but it was almost as if like, no, I am at that level. It's just being noticed, you know, it's like I haven't noticed yet that the right, the right, mm. mo the right moment hasn't happened yet. The right person hasn't been there to hear it. And, that, and I kind of remember that, that incredible assurance but well, no, it's interesting because I think at the same time there, there were like moments or, or, you know, subplots or whatever that made, I mean, I'm not an expert really to talk on this film, but I do kind of remember there was obviously stuff that was putting doubt in his mind and that was this seesaw of emotion about, is this really something I should be putting this much time and effort into and energy? But then at the same time, it was like, no, you know, like I, I am this this could be my future. This could be the thing that rescues everything. I'm good enough, you know, and it's just, I haven't been mm. noticed. And I love that. That's a really powerful mantra. Um, I know it exists in this case within the sort of battle rapping world, which isn't perhaps for everyone, but like, regardless of whether that's your thing, you know, you'd, you'd look at this film and you'd go, well, no, this is about self-belief and worth and like uh, an, an outlet in life for, for stress. You know, it's like, this is his means of opening the valve and like, expressing himself and everyone has exactly, that exactly. everyone has that and so why who are you to discredit not that you are not you or anyone else but I mean like who would someone be to discredit that as a legitimate means of um opening the valve as I said I can't put it better than that and just that outlet and to, to again it's about living you know mm. and surviving. yeah I, I, yeah so living and surviving yeah and um I, yeah, for some reason, I wouldn't, I wasn't expecting you to say this film, but um, it's one I need to watch again. I've only seen it once. I mean, I, I think I, I know he's playing himself as, as, as he might as well be, but Eminem, to, to be a complete 
novice, really, if we're going to be honest. Uh, really no acting um, sort of background to speak of. And to come in and, and to give a really assured and powerful performance uh, and to really sort of throw himself in in both feet, um, I, I, I think was striking, was, was really striking. And um, B-Rabbit B uh, stayed in my mind as, as somebody, you know, who was, was sort of brave and honest and had that sort of um, respect where if you, if you could sort of, uh, if you could prove that you were better, that he would stand and applaud. And I always thought that was a really strong character trait that he was he was fair with it. It was only the 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 people around him were trying to be unfair, and that as you say to deny him the spotlight that, that really he he should well have had. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it's just an, another one of those films where I think you you've got to see it. You've got to see it. It's very stirring. It gets your blood pumping. And um, oh yes, yeah, um, yeah. That's probably as much as I can say about it without delving into things that I can't remember well enough or you know <laughs> but I, I um yeah I really enjoyed eight mile and that's just gonna have to get added to the list isn't it just for the record we've got internal sunshine good fellows contact train to Busan, dig thor ragnarok and eight mile at the moment there's things we need to either watch together or one of sure, us needs sure. to go off and watch so boom, 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 boom. Right, Lars, shall we uh, wrap it up there? Because um, it would be in keeping with the previous podcast's length uh, around the hour mark. And what that means is that this will be a trilogy, an honourable trilogy of mentions. And um, oh. quite. And um, it's quite funny, really, because we talked about a trilogy of film, which we assumed we would involve the top 10. But clearly, we, that's take, well, it's taking exactly twice as long as we thought, isn't it? It, it so, rather. yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening. And please do join us in episode four, where we'll complete the honourable trilogy of mentions and uh, and then really get into the, the business end. So, uh, yes, goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Chip, 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 chip.